Hi guys, we're about to start the live stream. I'm just setting things up. Trying to make everything fit on my screen. So give me one minute. Was that a hello from Russia? <laughs> All right. This would be easier if I had a second person, but I'm doing it myself. We're just going to work our way through it. All right, let me do a couple shares really quick. And then we'll get right into it. to see if this changes the title. For some reason, it's showing me the same one. <clears throat> the cyanobacteria live stream went really well, Derek. Uh, it ended up being a 45-minute discussion with a lot of input from other people. And today, we're going to talk about coral health. So let me rearrange myself here now that I've hidden everything. And I'll close Photoshop because I'm not going to need that. Get some memory back on my computer, right? And I need my broadcaster software in front of me. Where is it? There we go. Alrighty, so you guys should see something here in a moment. How did I do this the other day? It's been too long, I barely remember. Did oh, here we go. <laughs> Hit the play button. There you go, Mark. Way to go. So, hey, guys. I am glad that we were able to get back on. My goal, again, is to do this every Saturday at 2 o'clock unless something comes up, like last weekend. I was out of town, and I couldn't do the stream, but I was thinking about what the conversation would be about. So today we are going to be talking about coral health, and we're going to talk about coral growth because... When it comes to putting corals in our tanks, we all know how to buy them. We know how to stick them in the tank, but there's some confusion about how they're supposed to grow and how they're supposed to live. Let me see if I can... I don't really like how this is displaying because I can't really see everything, and I want to follow the chat. I wonder if I can move this. That would help me a lot. No, that's not going to do it. Wait, there we go. Let me drag this upward. That would be nice. Sorry, a little bit of lag here as I'm trying to get myself organized. Is that going to work? Yes, that works. All right, great. So I put up one Facebook uh, notification just to let people know. Feel free to share this uh, link if you're able to so others can tune in. And what we're going to do, first of all, when I say coral, that covers all the corals. So we've got soft corals. We've got LPS corals. We've got uh, SPS corals, which are the hard corals. There are gorgonians, there are the softies like mushrooms and so forth. And because of all these different types of animals, it's really hard to give you a blanket answer to how things should be taken care of. But I'm going to do my best in the next 40 minutes or so to get into what are some of the things that I do and answer some of your questions. All right. Um, I'm hoping that we are on the right topic. I see people talking about cyanobacteria in the chat box, but... Today we are talking about coral growth, so let's get you up to speed. Uh, let's throw a coral on the screen. So here is a couple of Montiporas that are growing inside my 280-gallon uh, system. This is actually an older picture before the purple grape Monty became a ginormous coral that it is today. So you can see right there, it's a small little guy, um, 
maybe two, three inches, and it's butting against another Montipora. And the problem with two corals touching is oftentimes they will fight. But we're going to get into how they can live together and not do damage, as well as when you need to interact and solve it. So let me jump to a different slide, because these are our topics for today. We are going to get into the following five points. It's so funny doing this because there's a 20 second lag and I wait for things to appear on the screen. Here we go, here we go. So we want to have healthy corals, we want to have good growth, and we want to avoid all the issues. And the challenge for most people is what is going to happen in your tank when you put these things in? And what do you know? I see one person asking already, what are good corals for beginners? Uh, it comes down to what is a good aquarium for corals? So once you've got that figured out, then you can start to decide which corals you'd like to add. My best recommendation to most people is to start with very simple corals like Zinnia. Um, I like the Colt Coral, which is in the leather family. Um, Zoanthids are very pretty. And these are all relatively easy corals. The reason I like Zinnia is because when it acts unhappy, when it's not its normal self, that tells you visually that there's a water quality problem. But Zinnia also can grow abundantly and take over your tank. And even more so, Kenya trees. Kenya trees, not only do they grow, but they drop their babies. It literally frags itself in your tank. And you end up with tons of Kenya tree, and it kind of takes over the tank. Now, if all you want is a very simple tank that you have to do no maintenance on, then keeping corals like Zinnia, mushrooms, uh, green star polyps, um, uh, Kenya. These are all corals that you can put in your tank and never think about again, and they will just fill it in. And a lot of these corals I just described are moving corals. So you get that interaction when you're looking in the tank. Things are moving. A lot of times... Okay, I'm just going to say it. A lot of times women love moving corals, and the guys seem to like the sticks, the things that don't move, that just have vivid color. But then you're relying on the activity of the tank to be fish. And as the fish move around, you can enjoy it, but your spouse, your girlfriend, you know, they may not like it as much, they may not understand it as much, because it's more like a diorama rather than a living, growing reef. Also, all these corals that I just mentioned, you know, it's funny, we call them beginner corals. After about six to nine months, you start to not like them as much, and then about a well, let's just say a year later, maybe a year and a half later, maybe a few years, that person will actually say, in my next tank, I will never put these corals in there. And the reason they say that is because they grow too quickly, they take up too much real estate, and there's no room for these special corals that you'd like to add. So like, let's say, for example, you love mushrooms, and you filled your tank with mushrooms, and the mushrooms grow everywhere in the tank. Then you turn around, and you get a really pretty SPS. I want to try this coral out, and you glue it on a rock with a little bit of cyanoacrylate, which is super glue gel. And then the mushroom is all shrunk down, and then it expands and fluffs up, and it touches your coral, your SPS coral, and it stings it, and it kills it, and you've lost your SPS coral because of a mushroom. The SPS coral might have cost you 40 bucks, it might have cost you $100, it might have cost you even more. The mushroom didn't cost you anything. Somebody gave it to you because they had too many. So you have to decide what do you want to keep in your tank. And when I moved from my 29-gallon aquarium, which was a little tiny tank filled with a lot of mushrooms, and I set up my 280-gallon reef way back in 2004, I swore there would be no mushrooms in my tank ever again. And I ended up uh, putting someone on the floor of my living room on a tarp with every piece of live rock I owned, and his one job was to sit there and pick off every mushroom he could find and get rid of them, and then put the rock in my tank. And he spent hours. And then two weeks later, I'm looking in the tank, and I'm finding little bits of mushrooms here and there. And I was like, he had one job. But actually, uh, I have no mushrooms in my tank. I did a good job of getting rid of them all. All right, someone is already asking, how does water movement play into, into or what do corals need when it comes to water quality? Uh, let me clean up that whole sentence. That was just a train of thought wreck. I would recommend you need good, decent flow in your tank for obvious reasons, which is going to be circulation, it's going to be oxygenation, and it's going to also keep the corals clean. For example, if you get a Montipora coral, like this one I was showing you a moment ago, they typically grow into a scroll, 
and they shelve out like a plate. And if you don't have good flow in your tank, detritus will land on top of that coral, and that area will be smothered with dirt, and the coral will die beneath it. And all the rest of it's alive, but when you blow it off of the turkey baster later, you'll have a big white spot that has either bleached or completely died. And then what's even worse is algae can take hold and grow there. So you want to have enough circulation to keep it cleared off. Or you need to spend some time once a week with a power head blowing off everything in the tank so that way everything's nice and clean because you don't have enough flow in every pocket of the tank. And that's kind of a challenge because we, we don't want to look at a lot of power heads. We don't want to put so much flow through the tank that it's ripping the skin off the skeleton. But there's a lot of obstacles that impede water flow. And so you'll have dead spots here and there in the tank. And you can keep adding another power head here and a power head there. My 29 gallon had four different power heads in it, plus a closed loop. And then, you know, later on I was able to adjust things and kind of grow things in a certain manner to where I could remove some of those extra pieces of equipment and just have a pretty tank. Um, Rich asks, what would be the easiest to start with when it comes to soft, SPS, or LPS? Um, let's, I've already talked about softies, so I'm going to talk about LPS. Very popular coral is going to be the frog spawn or the hammer coral. These are a stony structure with a big, soft, meaty polyp on the top, and they relatively have zero real physical care as a tank owner. You're going to have to maintain good water quality. You're going to have to do your water changes once a month, and you're going to have to good light. But it doesn't have to be great light. LPS corals are not nearly as demanding as SPS corals. <coughs> when it comes to SPS corals, like these two that are on the screen right now, these are the type of coral that will grow and fill in your tank and be beautiful. The, this picture I'm showing right now is from my friend Dwayne's tank, and this is a bird's nest coral. And if you look at it, you'll see it's very sharp and comes to a point. But all the way down, this, you know, down every single branch are hundreds of little tiny polyps. Each one of those polyps has a mouth, and they want to eat. And to the left, that green coral, it's a different type of bird's nest. And both of these corals are SPS corals, small polyp stonies. And they are good beginner corals when it comes to the SPS family. So if you want to try SPS, I recommend bird's nest or I recommend Pacillopora. And both of those corals grow rather nicely. Uh, bird's nest grows much faster, and Pacillopora is a little bit slower. But the neat thing about Pacillopora, it's a bumpy coral. It can, comes in pink, it comes in a metallic green, and um, I think there's one more coral, uh, one more color. But the point is, is that it can broadcast itself. It will broadcast spawn. So you might have a colony right here in your tank, and then one day you'll see this little tiny bit of growth, like on a piece of lock line, or over on the overflow wall, or on the rock work, because it threw a baby, and now it's growing a new one. And so sometimes you'll see that in people's tanks where they have Pacillopora in many spots, and they didn't actually plant it that way. They put it in the tank in one spot, and it spread to other places, and they had more. It's also a great time to frag a piece and give it to someone else at that point if you're worried about it spreading. I do want to give you a couple of tips about bird's nest. So, again, I love it. Uh, it also comes in a golden brown. That's what I have in my tank right now. And I have one that's uh, sour apple green that I think is really pretty. It looks best from above. Certain species of bird's nest, like this pink one you're looking at right now, when it comes to a point, it tells you that your nitrates are nice and low. And when the ends dull over, when it's supposed to be sharp and pointy, that tells you that your nitrate, nitrates have risen too high, and it's affecting the coral growth. And then the other thing I want to tell you about bird's nest is it grows really fast and it dies really fast. So if it suddenly decides to go south, there's a good chance you're not going to save it. Uh, but you did get to enjoy it for a long time. It's not like you're. Uh, it's not like you put it in your tank and a month later it's going to die. You could have it doing great for an entire year, and then all of a sudden, overnight, it just starts turning white and it just seems to be dying. And at that point, I never touch it. I leave it completely alone and let it go through its phase. And if 95% of it dies and only a little bit lives, I just wait for it to finish dying. I find a few pieces that were alive. I snip them off. I throw away the dead skeleton and I start a new colony from the little babies. If you reach into a coral that is dying, and this is kind of, this isn't just bird's nest, this is many SPS corals, I typically do not interact with the coral when it dies. It's already dying, and for me to manhandle it, for me to cut it, 
for me to grab pieces and put them somewhere else in the tank, for me to put glue on it and stick it on a new rock, even more stress than the coral's already going through. And I feel like I am going to kill it for sure at that point. So I usually just leave things completely alone. I took a picture of my reef. I'm just going to hold up the iPhone for you guys. Um, I've got a big stick of my staghorn that's dying right now. So, And this is going to be kind of a blue picture. Sorry, I was on the iPhone. But right here, there's a large white branch that has happened over the last week or so. It didn't continue to spread. You know, it spread a little bit, but not much. And, you know, for most of you, you're like, oh, my God, that's a huge section. And in my giant reef, it's just a small piece of a big colony. So I don't really worry about it. But uh, I just realized I wasn't even showing it to you. Ha, ha. So here's the picture of it right now. And you can see how it's turned white right here. And yet all the rest of it is blue. And some of the tips are a little bit cooked as well because I had some water quality things that happened. And... When that happens, I just leave the coral alone and give it a chance to heal. All right. So right now, the tank still is unchanged. I haven't made any changes on what's going on with the corals. Also, in these two slides on the right, now that I've, you know, I've shown you some death, I'm going to show you some good stuff. On the right is another type of Montipora, and that is Montipora hispida. And those little green circles, those are the polyps that feed. And on the bottom, under that, is a Monte is an Acropora miliopora. And what that coral has is, you know, it has these large polyps um, that are very hairy with, like, a long tentacle that comes out. And if you have a coral like this and it doesn't look hairy, then something may be nipping at it and affecting its health. It could be that you've got a flame angel or a coral beauty. More, more often, it's the flame angel. But different angels nip at corals, especially SPS corals. So you'll see people that have flame angels in their SPS reef, and you're thinking, well, how are they doing that? Well, oftentimes they have so much coral, they don't worry about it. It's, it's not like one fish can just decimate a tank. If you had a very small tank, you had a small fish, and you had three corals, it could kill them. But when you have, you know, several feet of coral in your tank, and the flame angels going around nipping here and nipping there, they usually don't worry about it. I had a flame angel on my tank for the last year or so, maybe longer, and uh, it caused no harm at all. I mean, I saw it, it, it ate food, and I you know, saw it swimming around a lot and eating stuff out of the water column. I didn't see it attacking corals. You know, I saw it go kiss one from time to time, and then about four weeks ago, it vanished. I think the anemone ate it, <laughs> because I have no carcass. There was no proof of life. It's just gone. And it's kind of a bummer, because flame angels are really hard to come by that are good flame angels and not troublesome flame angels. But back to this Miliopora, the one I was talking about that's hairy right over the Milo's Reef logo, that coral right there should have polyps extended. It should look furry, and it would be healthy and happy. Also, if you look at the very tips of it, the tips are, in this case, a little bit bluish. Uh, sometimes it's going to just appear to be white because the skin is so thin in that one spot that you're actually seeing the skeleton underneath. That's the new growth. And a lot of people worry. They say, hey, I bought this coral, and, you know, it's supposed to be purple, but all these tips have turned white, and I'm afraid it's dying. Well, it could be that it is dying, or it could be that it's new growth. And so you have to determine what exactly you're looking at. And the very first piece of advice I'll give you is turn off the blue lights and look at the tank under normal lighting. If you can't disable your blue lights, which I know you can, Grab a flashlight and shine a light on that coral to see it was a normal daylight because you need to see the health of the coral. When you go to a doctor's office, they don't just say, hey, okay, you know, lay down this table, we're going to turn on a UV light and check you out. They are going to put you under bright, hot, white lights and look at you to see what's wrong with you. And it's the exact same thing with your corals. You can't um, analyze and decide what's wrong with the tank based on blue lighting because blue lighting hides everything. So look at the coral. And here's what you're looking for. So you've got an SPS coral. The tips are white. You're concerned. You've turned off the blue light. Now, what's happening at the tip? Is it just skin? Is it bare skeleton? Is it algae growing on the tip? If it's algae, it has died, and you're going to have to go in there, and you're going to have to actually physically snip the top off where the algae is, just cut off all that, throw it away, and then the tissue of the coral will heal over the tip and be nice again. The coral will never heal on its own from algae infestation. It absolutely cannot do it because algae grows much faster than coral. 
So whenever you have a coral that is in trouble, it has a patch of cyan, cyan on it. It has hair algae. It's growing bubble algae. These are the times when you have to get in there and you're going to have to clean it out. And there's a couple of ways of doing it. Uh, one is just do it in the tank. And you would just turn off the flow in the tank so you can see what you're doing. You look through the surface and you're snipping the tops of the corals off. And you're and I'm just talking about the very tip. You know, <laughs> you don't want to go in there and really aggressively cut way down low because the coral is fine underneath the little bit of algae sitting at the top. But you want to just slice it off. You'll see stony coral, and then the growth will reheal over it over the next week to ten days. And you want to make sure it stays that way. If you start to see algae again, you'll have to snip again. You can take a turkey baster and blow off the coral to make sure you've knocked everything out of it. You can use dental tools to clean it out. But the rest of the time, it's just a matter of letting the coral be and letting it recover. Okay. Best lighting ratio for corals. Cedric is wanting to, uh, is discussing actinic versus 12K or 10K. And the best lighting for coral is a color that we don't even like. And that would probably be around 6,500 Kelvin. And that's a very yellow white light. And that's matching what the sun puts out. But for us, we like to have a more pretty mixture of color so your tank will look prettier. And so what I have always recommended is that you have a few hours of daylight lighting hitting your tank and then a few hours of the blue lighting to make yourself feel good. <laughs> There's some guys out there that run blue lights all day long. Okay, so let me tell you what the difference is between white and blue. When you run the white lights, you will get the growth. When you run the blue lights, you get the color. So in the past, some farmers would grow all their corals under sunlight or under the 6500 Kelvin to get a lot of fast growth. And then they would move it to an area under a 20,000 Kelvin bulb that's pure blue and leave it there for two or three months to really color up while they're growing more new ones. And then they could sell those colorful corals. So the blue does excite the colors in the body of the coral, which is great, but it doesn't encourage growth. That's why they're growing them under the white light first. So I like to do the best of both. And so I start off my day, my tank is under 10K lighting. And then after an hour and a half, two hours, it switches to 20K lighting for the rest of the day, which is only six hours each. Um, I, mean, I have a lighting video on my channel that you can watch where I go into all the detail. I want to make sure I, I was clear about that. My metal highlight bulb, each one that comes on is on for six and a half hours. So I've got an hour and a half of white light, and then it turns off, turns back on, and becomes a blue light for another five hours. And I have my light staggered, so the first light comes on, and it goes through its six and a half hour period and after about an hour and a half or so the middle light comes on and joins the first light and then after an hour and a half the third light comes on and joins the other two lights now all the lights are on and then this one turns off and then this one turns off and finally this one turns off and the reason i do this i like the light to move across my reef throughout the day and it lets my day be longer without running metal halides longer all right let's see angel says hello from brooklyn new york Um, all right, back to this. I want to go back to this slide again. Okay, so we talked about um, lighting for a moment there, and I want to talk about water quality because that is a very important one, and it depends on the size of the tank that you're running because if you are growing coral out and your tank is very small, let's say it's an all-in-one 29-gallon tank or an all-in-one, you know, one of these bio cubes or you have something you know, like the Biota, which are really small tanks. They're kind of a little bit tricky to dose because they're so small. Not impossible, but usually people with the tiny tanks rely on only one thing, and that's water changes. And they'll change water every single week because it removes uh, nutrients from the water, it helps keep nitrate and phosphate down, and it's replenishing all the elements that are needed by the corals on a weekly basis in that water change. But for those of us with larger tanks that have a sump underneath, um, that have reactors running to polish the water and to add uh, uh, calcium, alkalinity, um, magnesium. These are all things in my reactors. Uh, I even run biopellets in a reactor to remove nitrate from the water. With those larger systems, we run a lot of gear. Um, and this is an interesting thing that I've noticed. Uh, about 15 years ago, everyone was running their tanks um, and they were running them with calcium reactors. 
And a calcium reactor is a big reactor with a pump on the side, and I'm going to do a video about this. And the water recirculates through there. And we pump CO2 into the reactor, and the media inside the reactor melts. And as it melts, uh, you know, you don't see it. It just, it's literally dissolving over time, and get, over a period of five months, you end up with less and less media. But as it melts and drips back out of the reactor, it's adding alkalinity and calcium to the water, which then in turn the corals use to grow. And so everyone in calcium reactors, and those that didn't, were using caulkwasser as a way to replenish the alkalinity and calcium through evaporation. And by adding this to the water, their corals could grow, but they were highly reliant upon either the reactor doing its job or there being enough evaporation that they could add enough caulkwasser to make those corals grow. And the problem was, back in those days, is that a lot of people killed their tanks with caulkwasser. I mean, they would crash. The entire tank would turn milky white because something terrible went wrong. It added all the caulkwasser at once. It raised the pH in the tank, and all the corals went up in smoke, and even fish. So I'm very, very cautious about telling people to use caulkwasser. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's uh, the same stuff that's in pickling lime, and it has a pH of 12. So when you're running a tank at 8.1 to 8.3, and you pump in some pH 12 fluid into your tank, it's going to raise the pH. And if you pump in a lot, if something goes wrong and it adds and adds and adds, it will then end up creating a very high elevated level of pH in your tank. It could be 9, it could be 10, it could be 11, while you're just going out to dinner. And by the time you come home, it's a disaster and you're trying to solve it. Um, make sure you Google how to solve a caulkwasser overdose and get yourself the exact information so you're prepared. I can tell you that white vinegar will bring the pH down quickly, even though the tank looks like crap, and that will help recover the tank. But I'm not going to tell you how much because I don't remember. What I do when I need to know something, I remember to Google it. And so if someone called me and said, hey, I just overdosed my tank, I would go to Google and I would type it in and find out how much white vinegar I have to use. It could be a couple tablespoons per gallon. I don't remember. But you obviously don't want to put too much because then you'll lower the pH too much. So learn what you need. Be ready in case something goes wrong. All right, so fast forward about three, four years. You know, people are sick of watching these tanks, these beautiful tanks, die of caulkwas or killing all their corals that they spent so much time growing. And that's the worst part. You put a coral in your tank, you grow this beautiful colony, and then something goes wrong with your system, and you watch the coral die. And as the coral dies, you get hurt, you know, right in your heart. Why? Are you hurt that a coral died? Or are you hurt that you lost all that time growing out the coral? See, that's what bothers me. It's not that the coral went south and something went wrong, or that it fell into another coral, or the anemone ate it, or whatever happens. What bothers me is that I just lost nine months of growth, or I lost 18 months of growth, and I have to restart and wait 18 months again to get where I just was. That's what bothers me. Okay, so I was talking about calcium reactors and caulkwasser. And calcium reactors were expensive back then. They're still expensive, but a lot of people shifted to two-part dosing. And two-part dosing is adding alkalinity and, magne uh, I'm sorry, and uh, calcium every single day. Some people did three-part dosing where they also added magnesium to the mix. And so each day they're adding a little bit of this uh, mixed-up solution in a very specific amount. You don't just pour some in. You literally would say, okay, I need 15 milliliters or I need 17 or I need 31. And it's based on the water volume of your system, the true water volume. So they start doing two-part dosing and people would pour this in every single day in an area of high flow. Well, um, go forward another year or two, and now people start buying dosing pumps. And so they can mix each section, and a lot of you probably do this. You have your alkaline in a jug, you have your calcium in a jug, you have your magnesium in a jug, and you've hooked up a dosing pump, and you're telling it to trickle in this amount every hour, every two hours, once a day. Whatever it is you like to do, that's what you're doing, to maintain the various levels of alkaline calcium magnesium consistently because you need very stable water for corals to grow. If your water spikes like the stock market and it's tumbling down and it shoots way up, your corals are not going to grow. If you have fish nipping, corals aren't going to grow. If your temperature is shooting up and going down, it's not going to grow. If your flow is high and then suddenly it's crazy low for nine hours, they're not going to grow. They need consistency. Just like you want your house to be the same temperature all the time so you can be comfy, your tank needs that comfy temperature point. And so you try to hit a certain area. I did another video where I recommended keeping the temperature between 77 and 79. 
and uh, that's kind of my target area I aim for. Some shoot a little bit higher. The higher you go on the Fahrenheit scale, the more oxygen is used up. So keep that in mind. Uh, someone recently was posting on one of my videos about how they went to a coral reef and they measured the temperature and they said the water was 85 degrees and everything was fine. I love when people say it's fine. Um, the problem is that reef is in the ocean with a huge surface area. So there's lots of oxygenation. In an aquarium, we don't have a huge surface area. We have a couple of feet. Maybe, granted, mine is about 14 square feet on top, I guess. No, that's not right. 21. But 21 square feet of open water. That's still not going to add a lot of oxygen to a reef that is growing and breathing beneath the surface. So when the... When the uh, temperature rises to 85 or higher, oxygen plummets really fast, and you're going to have fish start dying. And as the fish die, ammonia rises. Ammonia rises, starts killing corals, and it's a cascading effect. Okay, let's see. I'm, I've been kind of ignoring your, <laughs> your, your chat so I can stay on track. Um, what is the correlation between calcium and alkalinity? All right, that's a great question. Uh, thanks, Wayne, for asking that. There is this... Um, magic triangle. And in that area, you want to have your alkalinity, your calcium, your magnesium, and your salinity all in this one certain spot. And if any one of these is outside of that target area, what ends up happening is you see an issue in the tank. Like if alkalinity shoots way up and your all the other ones are normal, you may start to see corals responding negatively. Like LPS corals will tighten up and they, they'll be closed. They won't be open and flowing. They'll just be like this. Like, what did you do? And it's because alkalinity got out of control. And when I say out of control, the target area is somewhere between 8 and 11 dKH. That's your window. If you're at 13 or if you're at 14 or if you're at 15, you're a little too high. You need to get it back to somewhere between 8 and 11. Now, that doesn't mean you should go 8 to 11 all the time. If you like... 8.5 dKH, stay at 8.5 dKH. Maybe 9, then maybe down a little bit, but stay very close to that number. If you prefer to be 10.5, stay at 10.5. But, and that's where I was talking about before, you're going to stay stable. Uh, calcium levels should be between 375 and 425. That's kind of that area that I like to aim for. My tank tends to run a little bit higher in that regard, but uh, maybe 350. Uh, sometimes 375. And if you get too high in calcium, there's not a lot you can do to bring it down besides changing the water with salt water that has a lower calcium level within it. Um, otherwise, you just have to wait for the livestock to use it up, to consume it. So if your calcium's too high or your alkaline is too high, the first thing you do, stop dosing. Uh, don't dose it all that day. Don't dose the next day. Uh, maybe check on the third day, measure everything, and see where you're at. If it still hasn't come down yet, but alkalinity is starting, you know, and I'm just mm, jumping ahead. If one element is too high, stop dosing that one element. I'm not saying stop all your dosing. So, for example, you're dosing with an automatic system. It puts in a certain amount every single day of, the, of alkalinity, of calcium, and magnesium, and suddenly you discover alkalinity is too high. Stop adding alkalinity. Continue the calcium, continue the magnesium. Just normal. Nothing changes. Make sure everything's fine. Look at your livestock. Look at your fish. That's the first thing I do whenever I get a weird result in my test kit. I look at the livestock to see if they're really having a problem. And that's the weirdest part. You know, I joke that my reef lives despite me. Because uh, last year, I had a pH controller go nuts yet again. And my alkaline shot way up. I mean, it was way up. 22 dKH. I thought, what? That's no way. That's not possible. So, you know, I, I do one of these. That's me looking at the tank. I'm like, what the heck? And the tank looks fine. The LPS are not crunched up. I'm thinking, how can my tank be 22 dKH? That's not possible. So I test it again, and it's 21.5. I was like, all right, it's correct. Well, the first thing I did was I stopped adding any more alkalinity to, alkalinity to my tank. And in my case, that means stop adding CO2 to the calcium reactor and just let it run without so it doesn't melt, so it doesn't add alkalinity. And that was my solution. Now, if you were dosing two-part or three-part, you would stop dosing alkalinity for two or three days. And you can measure alkalinity each day until you get to that level you were meant to be at, get back on track, and then resume the dosing again. The same principle works with calcium. 
And when it comes to magnesium, that one's a little harder. You can't really get rid of it quickly. It, it takes forever to bring it up, but once it's up, it stays up. And uh, I used to use a salt mix years ago on my reef that every bag of salt I mixed up was 1,600 ppm magnesium. So I could not lower it. My tank literally was 1,600 ppm of magnesium um, for, uh, well, three years. <laughs> and the hardest part, of course, was I really had unhappy snails because the higher the magnesium level in the water, the less a snail will travel to your tank. It atrophies their muscles. They just don't move, and they're not snacking on your algae. So that was kind of a downer. But I had no cure other than changing salts, and I liked the salt, so I kept using it. Uh, finally, I could no longer get that salt. Problem solved. And now I have to dose magnesium again. It was like, oh, yeah, I forgot how to do this. I haven't done it in so long. But uh, I dose magnesium in my tank with its own little dosing pump, and I mix it up a gallon at a time, and I have it add basically 90 milliliters a day until the jug is empty. And about every three or four weeks, I replenish that. All right, let's see. I don't know if I answered any of your... And so back to the correlation, how they all tie together. If one is out of balance, the corals don't grow. When you have everything in the target range and you keep it stable, if you keep it right there in the middle, um, then your corals should do well, as long as you don't have something else messing with them, like a chemical hitting the water or a temperature swing or a salinity drop. All right, let's see. If you have never used uh, a two-part solution before and you don't feel comfortable mixing up powders, uh, no, you know, if you had to mix up alkalinity and you get this pouch of alkalinity, then you can buy a product that's already pre-mixed. Uh, there's several on the market. Um, ESV makes B-Ionic, and it's a two-part. Um, Two Little Fishies makes something called Sea balance um, Prodibio has an Alka Plus and a Calci Plus that you can dose every 15 days, I believe. Um, I mean, I guarantee you every brand has their own two-part. But a lot of people like to buy the powders, and they stir and stir until the water's clear, and then they hook it up to their system. I uh, mentioned in the last live video that I hate two-part. I just can't stand it. I'm ready to set up a second calcium reactor for my frag tank and get it back on track. But um, the thing was, the reason everyone went to two-part is because it saved them money. And uh, I'll tell you guys a quick story. Many years ago, Randy Holmes Farley, he wrote an article about how to make your own two-part solution at home using baking soda and uh, using uh, calcium... I'm probably going to say the wrong word because I'm on a live stream. Hydroxide. Um, and uh, he even talked about magnesium uh, because there was this stuff that they would use in the winter in the northeast of the U.S. to melt ice on the roads, and you could buy these giant bags of magnesium chloride, and you could mix that up, and you had your own three-part, and it didn't cost you anything. And then one company came along and started selling that exact recipe, and they'd ship it to your door, and that company has now grown into a huge company that you know of as BRS. And uh, they've been selling these powders for well over a decade. And you still can buy your own baking soda, if you like, at your local supermarket. It's Arm & Hammer. And you can bake it in your oven for 45 minutes at 200 degrees. And then you have soda ash, and it's ready to mix. And two cups of that stuff mixed with a gallon of RODI water, and you have a gallon of alkalinity for about 99 cents. Well, probably about 25 cents, because a box does way more than a gallon. I think a box, well, it depends what size box you buy, I guess. Alrighty, uh, let's see. Let's see if I've missed anything. Rasmus just wrote, and he said that they tried ChemiClean, and their uh, their cyano is gone. So I'm very happy for you, buddy. I'm ho I'm happy for both you and your wife that that's resolved, and your tank is nice and pretty again. Um, calcium chloride. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to another slide. I've got one I wanted to show you guys that I thought was nice. All right, I'm going to jump to this picture right here. This is one of my favorite moments in my reef about six years ago. I had taken an SPS coral, and I had zip-tied it to a rock so it wouldn't move anymore. And over time, the tissue grew over the zip-tie. Can you see how that looks? Do you, do you see what you're looking at? That's an Acropora miliopora, 
And you can see the long tentacles that I talked about earlier. And there's that wide band right there in the front of the picture. And that is actually the zip tie being completely covered. It was so awesome because I didn't see a zip tie anymore. And the reason I used a zip tie is because it was the easiest way to make that big stick stay in that one spot. And I watched not only the skin cover it, and I call it puddling. I know it's encrusting, but it looks like a puddle as it moves its way across, and finally they connected, they completely covered it, and then you see the polyps forming right there on the surface. And that was amazing to me, because I was able to just watch a coral take over an area of my reef. It didn't care what was in its path. Plastic, rock, doesn't matter, and it grew right over it. And that's the kind of stuff that excites me in a tank. <laughs> I just love to see how corals grow. Now, if you have a coral hit another coral, uh, they, like, for example, a rock slide happens. Let's say you have cucumbers, and they're, they're mining the sand bed, and then the rocks shift, and this rock tumbles and knocks a coral into another coral. Usually when the two corals hit each other, there's going to be warfare, and something's going to die. Um, sometimes corals just grow too close together, like I was talking about in this picture right here before, and they rub up against each other, and when those corals touch each other, the, uh, they could fight. Now, in this particular image, these are two Montiporas that don't hate each other, and they totally can touch. And, but eventually, that purple one, you can see how much larger... They were identical size when I put them in. And I thought the green one would be pretty cool because it grows up while the purple one plates outward. But instead, the purple one just outpaced it big time, ended up shading the green one, and the green one is long gone. So you may have to interact with your corals and move them apart so you can continue to enjoy them because that's exactly how nature works. You know, survival of the fittest. And uh, in this case, the coral did exactly what I would expect it to do, and it overran it. And, you know, when you see how it's puddled under a rock, you can't remove it. It's, it's encrusted. All you can do is chip the rock off or break a piece off and move it somewhere else. Let's see. I've never done the grafting. Uh, Maurice just asked, you know, can you graft different colors? And some people have successfully grafted some different Montiporas together. They would take a, a green Monty and an orange Monty, and they would put them side by side on a plug and let them grow together, and they become one piece. Uh, there was one a few years ago that was pretty interesting because it looked like a checkerboard. And you had all these different, uh, well, it looked like a checkerboard, exactly like what I'm describing. It's in your head now. And you had the different colors, and it was really neat looking. But there are some corals that you try to combine together that you think would be fine because they're the same species and they still don't like each other and it doesn't work out. So it's really a, uh, uh, it's a mad science experiment. You can try it and see if it'll work for you, but there's no guarantees that it will actually play out as planned. Um, all right. When do you need to act? I kind of touched on this before. When your coral has fallen over. Okay, you guys have seen my 20,000 gallon reef tank video that I did with Joe Waiulio in the Long Island Aquarium. He had this huge section of rock fall over and all the coral went with it on top of the other corals below. And he posted a picture on Facebook and he said, I'm just going to leave it and I'm going to see what it does because this is totally natural. And I thought he was crazy and I said, nope, you're not leaving it. And the next day he writes, okay, I can't take it. <laughs> I gotta get in there and I gotta fix it. Because you had corals laying on top of corals and you know some are not gonna live. So, plus, now you've created shadow on top of corals and corals need light to grow. So, he had to interact. If you have a rock slide, if you have corals fall, you have to interact. But if you just have a little bit of an issue going on in your tank, I mentioned this earlier, I just try to keep my hands out of the water, don't touch it, and leave it alone. In the past, people would often say, as soon as you see a problem, Get the coral out, frag it, save a piece, do everything you can because you might lose it, the whole thing. And I don't follow that advice um, because, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like the coral's already stressed, and as soon as I start manhandling it, I'm just going to push it right over the edge, and it's just going to completely die. So I don't jump in and act. Instead, what I do is I hope for some SPS DNA, and that's where I have just a few little polyps. And I mean, it could just be the little green polyp like on this Monty on the right to my, to my left. <laughs> and those little, if I get, have three or four little polyps live, then I will just let them re-spread and regrow. This works for chalices. This uh, works for SPS corals. 
LPS not so much, but if you look at the trunk of an LPS coral, you'll oftentimes see little babies budding out around the bottom, and you can snip those little guys off and put them somewhere else. Or you can just leave the colony alone and wait for the little guys to grow and become larger, and then once they're big enough to handle themselves, then kind of trim out the dead skeleton. In my reef right now, I've got a, a big section that's completely devoid of life because the anemone walked right over it and killed it, and I still haven't reached in there to clean it up. It's because I kind of feel like as soon as I trim it away, the anemone's going to say, oh, there's a spot I can crawl, and you're going to go through that spot. So I kind of like that I have this wall of death for the anemone to touch and say, yeah, I killed that, it's gone. And at the same time, it's a, kind of like a, a fence to keep the anemone where I want it to be. Oh, great question. What do you feed your corals? Thank you for asking that, Mark. The corals in my tank are not directly fed, but there are certain corals you have to feed. I mean, absolutely must feed. The non-photosynthetic corals, like um, sun corals, uh, certain gorgonians, they literally have to be fed food that they can capture and swallow and ingest and digest. And there's other corals that don't need that kind of direct feeding and can just live off of whatever they happen to catch in the water column. LPS corals, you can feed them. ACANs grow faster if you feed them. If you don't feed them, they'll just kind of grow very slowly. And it's fun to feed corals, but there's a challenge to that too. Because, okay, you've got your reef tank, you've got your corals, you've got your food, and what's the first thing that happens when you get near your tank with food? All the fish swarm. They get very excited. They know you. They definitely recognize your feeding cup or, their, or their, the jar of whatever you always use. They know it. And so when you try to feed corals, they will steal that food. So the first thing I would recommend is that you try to feed corals after lights out when the fish have gone to sleep. And what I do is I turn off all the lights, of course. You know, I mean, through the timer, it, it's just gone dark. It's been an hour. I thaw some fish food like some mysis or um, <clears throat> uh, what else do I use? I like mysis. That's kind of my favorite. And I thaw that, and then I have a little small turkey baster or a little pipette, and I will turn off the flow in the tank, and using a flashlight... I can shine a light on the actual coral, like a sun coral, and feed the polyps. And with a sun coral, you've got this colony. I wish I'd put a picture of the sun coral in this presentation, but I didn't. Um, there are, let's just say, 60 flowers or 60 polyps on there. If you just feed five, there is some passing of food between the, the intestines of this coral, but mostly the rest don't get a meal. So you do want to feed all the polyps on a 60 polyp head. That's going to take some time. And while you're doing it, you may have some fish that wake up and come join you to snack a little bit. Or you may have a big starfish come over to steal some. Or you may have shrimp, like cleaner shrimp and prepment shrimp, immediately run over to steal some food. So you're kind of dealing with that uh, uh, contest. You know, It's a battle of wills. Who's going to get all the food? I have tried things like give food to the shrimp, give them a piece of krill, let him go over there, and now I can feed this coral. And he will drop the krill and still come steal the food out of the sun coral. And uh, another one you can feed are fungias. They have this big mouth on the top, and they will open up. You can use frozen food like I suggested. You can use pellet food. That works as well. Um, you could chop up some krill into very small pieces. The trick is to get that food inside the coral itself and not just have it pollute your tank. So, and then the absolute most important thing you have to remember when you're done is turn the pumps back on. And I know that sounds super obvious, but this guy made a big dumb mistake many years ago and was going to feed the sun corals, had the food thawing on the top of the tank, and then suddenly said, you know, I'm really tired, I'm going to sleep. And I had the pumps off, and the food was sitting there, and I went to bed. And six hours later, I woke up, uh, someone had come over, I answered the door, and he says, why are all your fish on the sand bed? And I thought, haha, that's really funny. And oh my god, all my fish were on the sand bed because there was no oxygen. And I killed half my fish because I was an idiot because I didn't turn the pump back on. And, you know, I look up at the tank and there's the food still sitting there. And I was so mad at myself for forgetting. So whatever it is you have to do to remember. Uh, if you have a countdown timer feeding system on your pumps where you could have it disable the pumps for 15 minutes and they auto restart, that'd be great. Uh, if you uh, need to set a timer that will beep or chime or ring, to remind you to go turn your pumps back on, do that. If you have to put a post-it in some obvious spot, like <laughs> the middle of your pillow, go turn on your pumps, Mark, then do that. Whatever it is you have to do, don't forget. Don't don't make the mistake I made. That was a terrible... I was so upset. I, was, I lost some beautiful fish that I'd had for a long time that did nothing wrong. It was 100% my fault. So 
If you're feeding corals, make sure you remember you're feeding your corals. Make sure you remember to turn those pumps back on. Gargonians, I like, you know, like in my reef, I have a gargonian colony that doesn't need to be fed directly. It literally feeds off whatever catches in the food column. And that means it's catching food that I drop in every night, and it's catching the fish waste. You know, these fish, they eat the food, they poop it out, and that lands on the corals, and the corals eat it. So my whole reef is living off of the food they catch. Uh, I drop in uh, flake food twice a day through an auto feeder, and I do nori every few days. I, I used to do it more, not doing it as much. I don't like getting my hand wet. <laughs> and then every night I do frozen food, and I, I mix up a lot. I use a lot of Rod's food. I, I combine multiple packages. You know, I break off pieces from every package, and I stir it all up in tank water, let it melt for about 15 minutes, and then I pour it in the tank over the uh, LPS balmy of my tank, and then the the uh, pumps move the food through the reef, and the fish, of course, go crazy and they eat. But uh, you can feed corals directly one-on-one. -on -one. You can feed LPS corals, which is kind of cool. Remember when I was feeding that sun coral many years ago? I don't have it anymore. But there was a big uh, hammer coral next to the sun coral, and since the pumps were off, I thought, eh, I had the stuff that I loved to feed them. It was called cyclopes, and it was a very fine, um, it looked like little tiny red fleas, and it was a great food. It was super popular, very expensive, and the corals loved it. The fish would went nuts for it. We called it, you know, crack for your reef, <laughs> and it really did make a difference, and we can't get it anymore. It's such a bummer. But anyway, I took my cyclopes, and I was feeding the sun corals, making sure all the polyps got their, their dose. And then I went ahead and I uh, squirted some toward the hammer coral, and I just observed. And what had happened was the hammer kind of opened up wider, and then you could see the mouth in the center of the polyp, and the mouth opened up, and it became a larger and larger aperture, and then basically, very slowly, it drew water in, and as it drew the water in, it drew, you could see the food kind of congeal and work its way into the mouth of the coral. And then, you know, of course, you turn the flow back on, and it closes up, and uh, the, the coral was fed. And I only did that a few times. Hammer corals are very slow eaters, just like uh, lobophilias are slow eaters and fungias are slow eaters. These are corals that take 30, 45 minutes to capture food. And the problem is, is that you've got the, um, the shrimp stealing food. For example, I had this one coral that opened its mouth, grabbed the food, closed its mouth, and then a shrimp ran over and reached in with his claw into the mouth and pulled the food out and ran away. Couldn't believe it. So... You, you know, I tried to outwit the shrimp, so I took the top of a two-liter bottle, you know, I cut the bottle, and I had the dome, and I drilled holes in the side of the dome so that some f circulation can move through this dome, and I pushed it down over the coral, and I could squirt the food through the opening at the top, and that would get food onto the coral, and the shrimp couldn't get near it. And the reason I put the holes in the dome is because if you forget and leave the dome on there, you suffocate the coral, and it gets no oxygen, and it will start to turn really pale. Now, I see our clock has been really moving along. I've, I went longer than I intended, but I want to get into this one topic really quickly. This picture here is a beautiful SPS that is RTNing. And when it comes to RTN, that stands for rapid tissue necrosis. And rapid tissue necrosis is so sad because it happens so quickly. Uh, what happens is you've got this coral that seems to be totally healthy, and all of a sudden the skin is flaking off. It's just coming right off the skeleton. It's blowing off in the water. There's nothing you can do to save it. In this one picture, you can see, you know, the, the upper section still has life. But by the next day, that entire colony was bone white. There was nothing left on it. The entire thing went up in smoke. So if you deal with an RTN event, I have zero advice other than just to say, oh, well. It, it's, there's no cure for RTN. No one's ever come up with some kind of solution. It usually was a water quality problem. That, that caused this coral to give up its life for you. And it has completely, I mean, it's, it's gone suicidal. You can leave it in the tank, uh, and of course algae will grow all over it. If even one little branch survived, you can snip that off, and you can put it on a frag plug and put it in a different part in the tank. But typically in the past, when you had a coral RTN, or even STN, which is slow tissue necrosis, when that happens, you just hope for the best and watch. You just observe. But... Again, it's not something you can go, well, I'll cut off the healthy part on the top because, it, believe it or not, even as you cut it and disperse it different places in the tank, it ends up you lose all of it. it. It just is not one of those corals you can easily save. So it's kind of a bummer. 
Um, okay, so that's kind of it for today's uh, presentation. And I hope that you found some of this interesting and informational. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments when this video posts to YouTube and becomes a permanent one. There's going to be another video in a couple of days uh, because there's a contest. So if you would like to go to MACNA this year uh, in August, yes, that's right. <laughs> I was thinking I was at the wrong month. It's in about three, three and a half weeks. It's in Louisiana. And if you want to go, I'm doing a contest for a full pass. And so someone is going to get to win it. Of course, you've got to get there. But if you live near it, this will get you in the door for all three days. So that's exciting. Another thing I wanted to mention was Chasing Corals on Netflix is a great video to watch. Um, it's a Netflix documentary, and it's kind of a documentary about the documenters more than about the coral reefs themselves. But it was very interesting, and if you know just a little bit about the ocean, you'll learn more. If you know a lot about the ocean, you'll still appreciate it very much. I actually watched it twice. I thought it was excellent, and I, I hope everyone watches it because... We do have corals in distress in the ocean. And you know what? Uh, let me get into this really quick. <laughs> I can't help it. Every time I've heard, oh, the oceans have gone up two degrees and our corals are all going to die. I just think it's ridiculous. Our tanks go up in two degrees every day and our corals don't die. So why are they saying that? Well, finally, they said something in this documentary that made sense with me and it resonated. And I thought it was a great point. So when they talk about going up two degrees, they're talking about Celsius not Fahrenheit. And our bodies are 98.6 degrees. If we go up two points Celsius, and I'm, yeah, I'm just paraphrasing here, I didn't memorize it, that basically puts you around 102.4. When you're 102.4, you feel terrible. And you know, you're in bed and you just want to get better. Finally, it made sense to me that these corals are in distress because they have a fever. And, uh, you know, all this time I kept thinking, oh, so it went up to 81 degrees, so what? But, no, that made sense. So, yeah, these corals that were lost in the Great Barrier Reef, it's a terrible shame. I do hope that there's some SPS DNA out there that will restart and rebuild on top of the former skeletons. And, uh, you know, I hope that our governments worldwide will find a way to work together to save our oceans because our oceans are supporting our life, you know. That was that. Did I have anything else I want to talk about? I feel like I had one more thing I want to mention. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> Finally, and I think that's... Eh, whatever. I um, am trying out an Abyss pump. And the Abyss pump is the most expensive pump you'll ever buy in your life. <laughs> and they sent it to me months ago for a uh, product review. And I had it sitting here, brand new in the box, for a long time. And I finally oh, <clears throat> hooked it up about two weeks ago, and that thing is amazing. It, you know, it's, it's got a 10-year warranty, and it moves a ton of water, and uh, there will be a video review about this, this pump I think that you'll appreciate, because I'm also going to talk about how I changed all my plumbing to hook it up. It wasn't just, oh, just swap out a dark pump with an abyss pump and keep going on with your life, because my reef doesn't allow that. There's too many other things tied in. So I had to make a lot of changes, and so I've got some stuff to show you guys, and uh, I think that it'll be very interesting, and uh, I'll tell you this, I turned that pump up to 100% just to see what would happen. And the water across the surface of my tank rose up a half an inch, and all the corals that are touching the water had some space to grow upward. <laughs> and the water cavitated over the top of the colonies and over the big Montipora, and it looked like a river with eddies, just water swirling in all directions. It looked so neat. But, of course, I couldn't keep it at 100% because I would just rip the skin off all of my corals. You know, there has to be a balance point to how much flow you can put on a coral. And, um, you know, somebody asked earlier about flow. And, yes, flow is very important in our tanks. We need a lot. But you also need the coral to get used to it. So if you had a tank that had, you know, let's say you had a coral that's dealing with 1,000 gallons an hour of flow, and then you suddenly get a pump that's 2,000 gallons an hour, and you think more flow is better, you can't just take the same coral and hit it with that much flow because you'll end up ripping the skin off. But if you could go, you know, if it's a DC pump and you get it at 1100 for a couple of weeks and then 1200 for a couple of weeks and then 1300 for a couple of weeks, the coral tissue can build some strength to handle the, the added pounding of that water. And uh, so I get to play with the Abyss and, and see what it can do. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Thanks for watching. The next live stream will be on Saturday at 2 o'clock Central Time. 
And I think that one is going to be about feeding, unless you guys come up with a better topic in the next... I'll be reading the comments. So tell me what you'd like me to talk about, and I'll consider it. But for now, I'm putting in feeding as a possible topic. Thanks, guys.